just believe we can come alive We're so far from the ground But I'm not looking down Feel the warmth of the breeze rushing over me No Nick or Frank tonight, so tell your friends to tune in. Welcome everybody to Esports Canada TV, episode number 54. I'm your host, at Quinn in the Nets. You can follow me on Twitter or not. I'm not your boss. I'm just a guy who would love to be. Joining me are not my two regular co-hosts. Uh, Frank actually is going to be taking a bit of a hiatus. Um, he's had some things come up and he's going to need a bit of a break from esports as we all do from time to time. And so uh, he won't be here for the foreseeable future, but I'm sure he will return shortly. And uh, Nick, um, no idea where Nick is. He did not take the common courtesy to tell me he was not going to be here tonight, but such is the professionalism of a teacher. So joining me in his place, uh, he's going to fill two spots. Mr. Mike Daniels is going to talk to us about Canada Cup a little later on. Mike, how are you doing this evening? Doing very well. Thank you for having me on the show once again. Sure. Try to fill the large void uh, left by Nick and Frank. Or a small void, how you, however you want to put it. It's such a big void. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you filibuster the way Frank can though? I think I can do my best. <laughs> just completely <laughs> stop dead a conversation and interrupt. I'll do my best. That and just speak for like forty five minutes on it. <laughs> yeah, that too, and put everyone to sleep. Sure, I'll do my best. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, our very special guest tonight, um, anyone who's watched the 53 episodes preceding this one knows that it is geared a little bit towards uh, StarCraft. We are a bit biased, but we do enjoy covering other games, whether it be CSGO or Dota or indie games. We've had developers on and whatnot. But what we really haven't focused on, and I'm sad to say, is uh, League of Legends. And so because the World Finals happened on Friday, I'm guessing you all know if you were part of the one point whatever it was, six or seven million people that tuned in around the world. Uh, so we wanted to bring on a Canadian League of Legends uh, expert person in the scene who's making it happen, and his name is Sean Forcourt Jester Delaney. Sean, welcome to the show. How are you doing this evening? Yeah, doing good, doing good. Still kind of getting over the shock of worlds, but, you know, life goes on, and we're looking forward to Season 4 now. Fantastic. Always looking ahead, right? <laughs> It's the only way you can look in this industry, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So, Sean, I'll start you with the easy questions. Uh, where are you from, where do you live now, and how did you get involved with eSports? Long-time Canadian, living more or less the Toronto area, and uh, it's been that way for uh, 25 years, so kind of well-situated here in Ontario, and uh, how I got into eSports is actually not through League of Legends, I actually got to it through Heroes of New Earth back in the day. Uh -huh. It was... Uh, the sultry tones of breaky CPK and Honcast that actually lured me to the casting side of things. But uh, I also have to give credit to World of Warcraft, the arenas back in the day by uh, Van Seely, as well as, uh, I don't remember who his co-caster was at the time, but you know, between MLG, me moving, and then Heroes of New Earth, it just became a few months of me listening to casts and being like, I think I could do that. <laughs> so did you actually start with Heroes of New Earth? Were you casting games for them, or was the start yep. with League of Legends? God, it was a year and a half, maybe two years of uh, Heroes of New Earth before I even turned an eye to League of Legends at the time. And uh, that's because, I mean, Han had, he had a buy into the beta. I mean, it was either that or League of Legends. And I looked at League of Legends, and me being a hardcore Dota guy from back in high school, I was like, man... Having Dota in a standalone client with its own gaming engine, it's like, yes, 
heaven, yes. <laughs> so I got into that. But, you know, as time goes on and various things happened in the scene, League of Legends started growing more and more popular. And I think I started uh, joining the cast just before season one finals. Um, that's when I really started putting a lot of effort into it. And so how did you kind of make the transition from I'm interested in casting to now I'm a caster to now I'm a pretty damn good caster? It was uh, Fraps. I mean, I just downloaded Fraps, started uh, started up a YouTube channel, took like six hours to upload anything. I mean, my internet is, is not that great. It really isn't. Uh, but Fraps have yourself a fast hard drive and the will to just try it. I mean mm -hmm. that that's what it came down to. My our first game and I have it on my YouTube, my very first game was absolute total disaster. Like terrible, terrible stuff. <laughs> I go back and listen to it every now and then and I'm just like ah, I, I I just couldn't stand I can't stand myself now. Here I am, you know, a few years later. But, um, I mean, that's that's the growing pains of everything. Nobody's going to be perfect right off the bat. So how do you do it? You get a video recorder, you get a hard, fast hard drive, and you get the will to do it. And that's kind of how it went. Well, you're never supposed to record the very first one. Isn't that what they teach you in casting school? They don't teach I, casting school. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't save the archives of the first three or four Ralston Arcade broadcasts because they were so terrible. I was like, I'm not letting anybody else see that. <laughs> there are a few I did not upload, but I still have the very first. And it's on my YouTube and has like 250,000 views and all the comments are absolutely terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and so from a professional standpoint, I mean, how was it for you to kind of... You knew, obviously, you had to get better. Is that just straight up casting as many games as you can and, and playing when you can? Or is there a kind of method that you saw other people take that you thought, okay, this is the way to follow it. This is how I get to a certain level. Well, believe it or not, it was three or four solo casts in. I actually got approached by the people that I was actually hosting the replays with. Uh, and is a group called GameReplays.org. And they had an actual Han section that I was posting the videos in. That's how I was getting most of my feedback. It wasn't through YouTube. It wasn't through forums. It was through the posting system at GameReplays.org. And me and my co-caster actually got picked up after four or five casts because of not only the, the rate of improvement we were showing throughout the different casts, but our willingness to communicate with the criticizers on the forums and how we handled ourselves. Uh, I'll tell you, I mean, not everybody was kind enough to do constructive criticism, but mm -hmm. uh, I, have, I have a very diplomatic side to me when it comes out uh, in terms of writing. So the way that we handled ourselves, the rate that we kept going, it earned us a spot, kind of a junior commentating spots on, on the team. And from there, we then had a collective of people, you know, what, what went good, people to cast with, you know, having dedicated camera guys, people with experience that we could leech off of. And from there, we just kind of springboarded into a bit more serious stuff. I know talking with Nick and Frank um, when they're casting StarCraft, they, they talk about having, you know, that moment when all of a sudden you're, you're in the middle of a game and you realize, like, wow, like I'm... I've made it to a pretty good level. Did you have a moment like that where you kind of it clicked and you realized like, yo, I'm a I'm a League of Legends caster. Like this is real. I'm not just in my basement anymore. This isn't just me with my friends. You you're actually, you know, you have a following people tune in to watch you. Well, it's uh it's actually came three times that that moment. Uh it's because I've done multiple different games over the years. So, uh basically I had one for each game, but yeah, in the beginning, you're not that great, but I think it was DreamHack 2010, the winter games. We did try casting for Heroes of New Earth, and it just went absolutely flawlessly. And it was just like one of those moments, like, holy crap, this went so well. And the responses were phenomenal. Uh, I've had similar moments, so to speak, with uh, League of Legends, but it's not like a quintessential moment. It's always like um, every few months, I just feel like I've improved or I haven't. And when I have, it's, it's smaller versions of those moments. Uh, and it usually happens after bigger events. Uh, it's either you're going to crash or you burn or you do amazing. And it always feels great when you do amazing. <laughs> Not so much when you crash and burn. <laughs> no, no. Then you, then you crawl into a bottle for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And do you still um, keep up with Han? Or are you pretty dedicated now strictly to League? 
Yeah, not so much. Uh, I mean, the, the reason we left the Heroes of New Earth scene, uh, a whole bunch of us went to either Dota, uh, which is the success of the capitalist right now, is actually, uh, he came from the Heroes of New Earth days. Mm -hmm. uh, a whole bunch of us went to the League of Legends side for the lolreplays.org sister side that was actually fledgling. But the reason that a lot of us made the transition is because S2 Games actually did all of their premier broadcasting stuff with a company called Honcast, which they later assimilated. But because it was like an iron fist of, <laughs> of the control, it really didn't leave a lot more room for us. So the community casters didn't feel like, you know, there was nothing really for us to do. I mean, all the good stuff was taken by default, and that left us with not really that, that much else to, to pick with. So we left. And now here we are many moons later, and LCS pops up, the WCS pops up for, for Blizzard, and you know that, that iron control is, is back. And I'm just like, man, this is why I left Han. And now, <laughs> now I'm here, and it's just like, same thing happening. Uh, I do want to touch on that in a bit, but before we jump into kind of the, the whole League realm, um, barring Han, are there any other games that you dedicate some of your time to? Are you a full-fledged gamer across all consoles and PC, or are you kind of the Artosis style i got my game and that's my only game no i i play i play dota i play lol uh i tried a lot of the betas for the new mobas coming out dawn gate was uh pretty good i'm looking forward to strife i'm a big awesome knots fan nice. believe it or not 2d side scrolling moba on steam 3v3 style it's ridiculously fun Fantastic. it's really hardcore cutthroat at the top level but what game isn't <laughs> uh and so yeah, we, we have a lot of fun with that. I've actually hosted out the Awesome Knots uh, Pro Invitational uh, last two tournaments. And uh, it was an absolute blast. And we did those tournaments without spectator mode, believe it or not. <laughs> so it's a little trickier to, to do, but we pulled it off. And now the game actually has an expansion coming out. They just raised 200000 something. And uh, they're going to get full-fledged spectator mode. So I'm extremely excited for that. So are you calling, uh, are you calling that right now as the next big eSport? No, no, no. It, it'll never reach the, the levels of Dota and, and LOL, but it is a fun side sport. It's five bucks on, on Steam. Like, you can't go wrong. For the amount of enjoyment I've had for five bucks on Steam, it, it's well worth the money. Well worth the money. But uh, back in the day, also, we used to run some Bloodline Champions. You know, the game made for esports. No random elements, all team comp, picks and bans, draft, ladders, all, everything. Automated tournaments every day. And uh, we ran a weekly tournament called uh, King of the King of the something. I don't remember the name actually. It was <laughs> okay, <laughs> but it was a weekly tournament, and it had you know we drew like eight hundred people at max. You know, not not too shabby back in the day. You know, very pitiful these days. But eight hundred. I mean, we were really happy with it. And uh, Bloodline Champions. Yeah, too bad it didn't pan out. It was an amazingly fun game. <laughs> Great. Uh, continue on with uh, League of Legends, and I know you voiced a bit of your concern with the Iron Fist, and I remember we were talking about this on the show a couple months back, how kind of the community was in a, a bit, not a huge uproar, but just talking about how it's it's really hard now with LCS and the same with WCS for uh, StarCraft for those smaller communities and members and people to kind of work their way up and get those chances to do DreamHack and get those chances to do those bigger events because LCS seems to be like the big game in town and they seem to have that grasp on the entire uh, system. So can you speak about that? Is it is it hard now to get both as a player or a caster into the upper, kind of upper echelon? It's, as weird as it might sound, it's actually easier as a player, I feel, uh, in order to get into that kind of stuff. I mean, there's been a lot of polarization around certain names in League of Legends, uh, the majority of them being, of course, Riot Games. So Twitch TV slash Riot Games, hundreds of thousands of concurrent viewers whenever they go live. Can't even touch that. Nothing can touch that at this point. But after that, it's like there's no real popular streaming outlet that can even compare to that, even to a fraction of that. I mean, you might get ten or 20,000 on the odd national ESL, but Chaos TV, they run challenger brackets like every week, and I only ever see them in about five and 10,000. I mean, you're talking about 10% or less of the community cares to watch anything other than League of Legends uh, for, by Riot. 
I mean, pro players, 20, 30,000, no problem. Mm -hmm. But as a caster, it's like having a personal stream, a successful personal stream that you can use to catapult into higher tier League of Legends casting. It's, it's almost impossible at this point. I mean, if it's not Riot sanctioned, then you're looking at Challenger Leagues. And Challenger Leagues usually have all their casting uh, already set up by you know people that have been doing it for years. It's yeah. extremely hard to break in at this point. And do you think that has to do a lot with kind of League of Legends rising in popularity so fast and getting this LCS really off the ground with their whole esports push where not a lot of other tournaments really had the chance to be known as, you know, uh, as a, like a home story cup or like a dream hack or a, you know all these events in StarCraft before WCS came around I mean you could look forward to MLG to dream hack to home story and all these different events throughout the year do you think because league got so popular and so fast and came right out with LCS is that is that why people don't watch these other tournaments it's I guess again it's like the polarization uh, analogy I'm just going to keep using of Riot just hosting everything, but Riot has kind of killed a lot of their community aspect. Um, in terms of like popular esport community stuff, mm -hmm. uh, as soon as they created the LCS, we saw IPL go down, regardless or not if that was the reason it went down. Yep. IPL definitely suffered uh, because of that. MLG has now officially dropped. League of Legends from their roster because they're going for Dota 2 because of this control factor that Riot has imposed on these pro-level teams. And if it's not pro-level teams, people just don't seem to care. Like, I don't care if you're Diamond. I don't care if you're Challenger. I only watch pros. That, that's a big mentality I see reflected yep. in the numbers. So, again, like if nobody's watching, these communities that normally host competitive formats just drop it. Or they go bankrupt or they just move on and... I think that is overall hurting. I think the only real people still running with audiences is Chaos TV uh, for EU and National ESL for NA. And even then, the numbers are very spiky. It's anywhere from three digits to 10,000. Yeah. No, I think it, we, we run into the same thing whenever we try to run league events and do any sort of streaming. I mean, we can stream StarCraft, not with no-name people, but, you know, Masters-level players who are amazing players, mm -hmm. but they're not well-known people. And we can get, you know, mm -hmm. four or five, six hundred viewers, and then if we do the same thing with League of Legends, people say, you know, well, I only watch pros. Where are these people? Who Who is this UBC esports team? We're like, well, actually, they're super good if you watch them, but because you don't know their names, you know, you're not going to stick around, so. Yeah, if you're not a personality, nobody cares. Yeah. So how do you become a personality in that regard? It's it's a catch twenty two, and you know every now and then we'll see a new name show up. Like uh, Trick Two G got real popular real quick. Fabby got real popular real quick. But even then, I mean, they spike up and down. They spike up and down. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and are they the same sort of um, almost entertaining streamers? The same as like Destiny or. Uh... I'll say even like Maximus Black, people that go on and they're not really at that ultimate pro echelon, but they get, you know, the 10, 15,000 viewers because they're they're trolling, they're funny, they're doing things, playing with other pro players. Are, are there those people in League? There are. Uh, and Destiny and Maximus Black, I mean, they have cross-pollination yeah. going on. Uh, they, play, they both play League, but they also come from StarCraft, so yeah. they already had a fan base going in. Uh, Phantom Lord, though, comes to mind as kind of like the quintessential, obviously I didn't say that right, but <laughs> the ultimate entertainer for League of Legends. He has done extremely well for himself, not as a pro, but as an entertainer in League of Legends. And he gets 10, 20, 30,000 viewers. He has hundreds of thousands of views on his YouTube videos and his website you know, goes down every now and then just how much traffic it generates. Uh, it, it really has been a success story for him, but he's like one of the only few entertainer names that are not pros. I mean, he's a diamond level, challenger level, but he's not a pro player. Like he doesn't, mm. he's not on a team, he's not sponsored, he doesn't go into tournaments. He mostly just dicks around and people love it. People love it. Well, yeah, I always thought that there was kind of the three different types of streamers. There's the absolute pro top level where you're tuning in because you want to see how do I get better. There's the entertaining people who are there to troll, mess around, and they get a lot of viewers as well. And then there's the kind of 
teach you streamers like a Muslim or someone who goes on and actually says, you know, I'm going to run through these replays. I'm going to interact with the with the crowd. I'm going to, you know, I'm doing this to get views, to gain fans, to get exposure. So, uh, and I think they're all they all have a spot within each esport. Well, there it, there was a very popular teaching style, uh, analyst style, you know, somebody that would talk about the game and what they're doing and why they're making these decisions. That was Wings of Death. Uh, and he unfortunately hurt his hand in an accident and it required surgery and he still hasn't recovered. It's been, wow, it seems like months now hmm. since we've seen a stream from him. Uh, but he was extremely popular for a, for a good amount of time uh, simply because of this analyst style he would bring to the broadcast, you know, he would tell you why he chose that champion top, what items he's going, he'll tell you if it was a good play that he made or a good play that the enemy made, did he overextend, did the, did the enemy see a great opportunity, was he mm. caught off guard? I mean, a lot of analysis went into this stuff and people ate it up, no problem. Unfortunately, he did break his hand uh, and I haven't really seen somebody to kind of fill that role in a while, Scara every now and then, uh, when he does stream Cutie Pie from Dignitas. Uh, sometimes as well, but if you think about like you know an entertainer, it's Phantom Lord. If you think about a teacher, it's Wings of Death. If you think of a, a strict pro in law, odd one maybe, but he's kind of like a mix of all three at, the, yeah. at that point. Like there's nobody that really plays law just in a strict pro sense because yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's harder it's to hard do it in of terms of Starcraft. Yeah, right? the one v one, not too hard to to, to strictly be a pro in five v five, a little harder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Uh, and now I want to talk about the worlds. I did actually catch at least the first two games, which is fills my quota of League of Legends content for the of, year. <laughs> of which, though, of finals. Of or? finals. Of finals. Okay. And I, I caught you know <clears throat> two minutes here and there throughout the entire sort of uh, final tournament, but I actually caught full games in the end, and I was surprised of how much I actually enjoyed it. I was jumping up and down in my seat a few times and screaming and oh my gods here and there. And so I was pretty happy with the product. Um, the one complaint I did kind of hear from people were silly things like the crowd's not loud enough, which I think is just <laughs> stupid. But <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't see how that affects your enjoyment of watching anything. And um, and the other one was, is the tournament kind of skewed that the best two teams don't actually make it to the finals? There was a lot of ire in the or a lot of criticism as well in terms of how it was all set up because of the the way the buys worked the way each region had a certain amount of teams that could actually go through and it did kind of create some very skewed matchups really early like china versus china in the in the quarterfinals or in the semifinals and it's just like okay <laughs> um but i mean could it could it have been better of course of course, it could always be better. There's always room for improvement in these things. And just, I think the way that, you know, the card drawing system worked out in terms of a random element, we saw this in Season 2 as well, uh, in terms of, you know, how do, you, how do they determine who faces who? In Season 2, they actually had, like, a lotto, lottery ball machine. Have you ever seen the live drawings of yep. lotto numbers on TV? Yep. They did, like, the exact same thing in Season 2. And it's just like, this team faces... Uh, this team and this team faces this team. It, it was stupid, and in season in season three, they kind of they got rid of the machine, but they had the teams pull cards to figure out who their opponents was. It's just like I don't know. That just seems really silly in terms of doing a world finals without like mathematically determined seeds. So there was a little draw on that. You know, China versus China really early on. Korea versus Korea really early on. Mm -hmm. Did the top two teams make it to the finals? I really do think that SKT won. You know, they were they were destined for finals. Yep. I mean, they came in as the second seed from Korea, but Faker, man, Faker, <laughs> how do you not expect Faker to go to Worlds? Who was I, I, who was the number one seed? The number one seed from Korea was the other team, uh, Najin Sword. Oh, Najin Black Sword. Najin Black Sword. Okay. They were they actually won the first seed, and SK Telecom T1 won the second. Uh, and in terms of you know just listening to Monte Cristo go back and forth about their uh, matchups in Korea and how they well they know each other, it's Faker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think there was more hype about Faker than there was about Worlds just going into this this tournament because of the the just the the story of 
SK Telecom T1, you know, how these guys had never, three of the five of them never been in professional play before. Like, they were just solo key heroes. They were put together months before the tournament. And, hmm. You know, that, that kind of underdog story going in, and the fact they're from Korea adds a lot of weight to that. Uh, you know, just going into that, you know, we all expected great things, and bam, they win the tournament, no problem. Did OMG deserve to go into the finals? I don't know. Their, their, whole, st their whole strategy of one-trick pony of protect the AD carry and win... I, I don't think that really should have made it there, but you know, just the way that the cards lie at the end of all the drawings, mm -hmm. they made it through. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, it's funny. I was watching it with a couple of friends who are actually pretty avid league players. They follow the pro scene a bit, but they were saying, you know, who's going to win? Because I seem to follow esports more than they do. And I said, well, I, I'm pretty sure SKT one is heavily favored, and that. Uh, Royal Club is is the underdogs, and they were like, "Oh, really?" And then it goes to the the desk with all the analysts, and they went to all the pros and asked them, and they said, "Oh, three nothing for Royal Club. Oh, three one for Royal Club. Oh, three one for Royal Club." And I was like, "Oh, okay, maybe it is going to be a close match." Did you see it as a as a stomp? I mean, watching the games, I thought they were fairly close at least through first game and a half, and then it kind of fell apart there. But and I didn't watch the I third, was... which I heard was the the least close of of the three. But was it a stomp from where you were watching? I was really surprised nobody other than Double Lift, uh, or sorry, nobody other than Monty went for Korea. I am, I am mind blown that none of the pros even gave SK a chance hmm. at uh, at that. Because I mean, the Joe Miller segment had all the pros going, you know, three one, three three two, three zero for Royal, and then all the analysts except Monty said Royal and. That mind blew me at the time. It was just like, is it is this strategy really going to work against the Koreans? And you know, Monty is the only one that actually kind of gave his own prediction, rooted for his home team, came out on top, and they didn't even reward him, which I found really weird. <laughs> <laughs> but in but in terms of like, were they close? Were they stompy? I mean, game three was a twenty minute surrender. <laughs> I just, there was points where it's like, oh, okay, maybe we got a really good game going now. But, I mean, in all aspects, Korea just stepped up and yeah. was absolutely phenomenal. And well, I was, I was pretty intrigued. It was during, not really too surprising. Yeah, during game two, during the, when it came to the fifth and final pick for Royal, and they were all saying, oh, he's going to go Kale, it's got to be Kale, maybe, you know. It should be Kale, and then he picks Cassidy, and they all just like lost their mind. <laughs> they were just like, "Are you kidding me? What are they doing right now?" And then actually, for the first like twenty five minutes, it looked like, "Wow, that was such an amazing pick!" Like he's shouting them out left and right, and it looked like Royal was going to mount a comeback, and then it just completely fell apart. And that's when we went to bed because it was three in the morning here. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of the cast, and like, I, I. Uh... A lot of the time, you do see Kale going into like those blow up type of champs, like you know Fizz, like uh, Zed, because the only thing really to negate the damage is going to be either Zonia's, which you're not going to have super early on, or an invincibility tactic, which Kale exceeds at, which is great. But Royal either didn't care or uh, they didn't know about it, and if they didn't know about it, this would be the second time we've now seen teams that end up in cross regional matchups that didn't really pick according to what the analysts thought they would. And that, uh, and I'm going to go back to NA versus EU in the quarterfinals for this one because North America really dropped the ball when it came out to banning out the Cassidy from Xpeke. So I actually almost see that as a mirror situation here in the finals. Like mm. they, they might have just not known. But the expected result is, you know, Zed outscaled and blew up people in the end game and faker does faker does things faker things faker do or things faker does is blow up people with zed i mean so yeah i mean they should have probably done something better Kasten did great for a bit but by the end game he just didn't have what he needed to to carry the team uh is there cross server play at all in league in the professional league no Actually, in any league, no. <laughs> no? Okay. So I'll just I, amend that. Right I can't now. log into the Korean server from Canada? Well, you that's a bad example because you need a Korean social insurance number actually to, to play in Korea. Okay. But let's say you did have it. Yeah. You could log in from here, but it's a totally separate account from your Canadian account. Okay. Like okay. nothing will transfer over. You start at level one. No, I, I mean just in terms of like not being up to date with like the current 
curious strats or NA strats and just not knowing certain picks and counters and just being like, oh, we didn't know that was a strategy sort of thing. I just wondered if there is, can they actually go and train cross server? Because, I mean, in StarCraft, I mean, you go and you can train on Korea, you can play on EU, you can play NA if you're feeling really <laughs> desperate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have an EU West account, I have a EU East account, I have a okay. North American account, I have a Brazil account, I have a tournament account. Like, It's just really silly how many accounts I have. So you <laughs> can do that, but again, like, you start at level 1, and it's about, what, 200 right. or so wins to get all the way up to 30 so you can play ranked. Probably less if you're better. I mean, if you're a diamond going in at level 1, you're probably only going to take like 100, maybe 115 games mm -hmm. if you're that spectacular. But, I mean, let's call that 30 minutes each game. That's, you know, 70 hours, 60 hours yeah. that you got to dedicate just to get into ranked just to see what people are playing. I mean, it's much easier just to watch <laughs> the other <Yeah>. region rather <laughs> than play the other region. But, I mean, the analysts all had hundreds of people, you know, around the world just feeding them data from their specific regions. The, the Chinese team, the Royal, you know, mm -hmm. they didn't have that. So it really came down to their own research. And that is kind of variable. I mean, did they know about it and just didn't pick it? Sure, that's possible. Did they just not know about it? And if they didn't, they probably fired their research guy. <laughs> Be interesting to see. Uh, in terms of, and I know, uh, who was it that said it in the chat, if I can find it? Oh, <laughs> Annalisa commenting on uh, who are those old guys about the crystal method. Um, what did you think about the kind of production value and introduction and everything outside of the games for the finals yeah I had no idea why we were doing a live music piece absolutely no idea mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounded great looked yep. cool yeah at the Staples Center you got to do something I guess yeah um, I I don't really have too much of an like it didn't really uh, leave a bad taste in my mouth but it didn't blow my mind it's like okay they got an orchestra they did some awesome music uh, where's my game um, yep. that's kind of what I, I said to it. <laughs> Uh, but then, you know, the analyst desk, you know, taking a note out of, uh, you know, the Dota 2 production there, mm -hmm. uh, because they had an analyst desk that they would keep transfer transitioning into, and then they would go to their reporter, and they'd come back to the analyst desk and go into the next game. It Which was did all make chop, the breaks. Chop, chop. Yeah, it really chopped up the breaks. I didn't feel like in between games or even, you know, in the 10 minutes before the first game, I didn't feel like I was sitting there staring at the same guy, like, so who are you picking? It was They mixed it up pretty well. Uh, my one comment on the whole... Uh, music was they brought out the crystal method and they brought out Wes Borland the guitarist wearing the weird arm and face lights um, who used to be the guitarist for Limp Biscuit. but they didn't announce who these people were I'm sitting there and I'm watching crystal method and I'm like I should know who these guys are like they're probably famous like why aren't they telling me it's the crystal method and I had to find out later who it was like why why do you go through all the trouble of getting these famous people and then they're not telling us who they are like even if you knew that was West Borland like he's wearing a mask and some other stuff like what I, I, didn't, I didn't get that <laughs> I'm trying to do my best impression of the ASCII guy that goes like this <laughs> and I mean, uh, I mean wouldn't you follow the NFL's lead like you now see halftime show at the Super Bowl like four or five months before the Super Bowl and then yeah. half yeah. the Super Bowl is about the halftime show like yeah. let you know the Rolling Stones Paul McCartney you know, whoever is playing mm -hmm. the halftime show, you know about it like six months in advance. But it's the first time they tried it, I guess. Hard to say, right? Yeah. And I mean, it, as much as I want to see an orchestra playing, it'd be nice if they showed highlights, something over top of it, and not just painting it like I was watching a pay-per-view concert. It's just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like You're at I'm the there. Staples Center. you got to yeah. do something. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, but I mean, show us something going on, like, over top of the music, but... Seemed really long. It, it reminded me a lot of uh, video games live, like a segment mm. done there. Yeah, you know, orchestrated. But going into video games live, you you know really what you're expecting. You're expecting yeah. video game music done in an orchestra with special guests, and here they all are. And it's just like what Mike said here. You know, absolutely nobody really seemed to know what was going on. They didn't know who they were until yeah. the afterwards. And I mean, you could have used those names to draw people. Yep. You could have. One hundred percent. I'm sure there's yeah. still some Limp Bizkit fans floating around. I, <laughs> Limp Bizkit, you can't go wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> so all in all, I mean, uh, with the small bit of negativity that surrounded the worlds, I definitely enjoyed it. I would definitely watch again next year, and I'm sure you feel 
the same oh, way. I mean, I vastly enjoyed the whole production of everything. You know, yeah. hearing uh, almost six million CCU. Uh, I think after you factor in all the Korean television numbers, yeah, uh, is yeah, it's a pretty good, pretty good global reach. Uh, I believe it's something like one million NA, uh, two million uh, China, and three million uh, Korea, something like that, uh, in terms of the big numbers. Uh, but you know, really good reach, really good production. I, I actually sat down and watched the quarterfinals with my brother. He doesn't play League of Legends, but he wanted to see you know what's all the fuss about, right? Mm. So we sat down and we watched the intro and all those you know segments with music and interviews and translations and all the transitions into the the caster. He really liked Monte Cristo because it was, he was in like this really sharp white shirt. Had you know the buttons, the tie all the way done up to right up to the neck, the suspenders really clean and crisp. He's like, this guy is amazing, because <laughs> uh, he's sitting beside Crepo, who's wearing a t-shirt. You know, so yeah. he looks much better in comparison. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he got to sit down, he got to watch it, and he's like, man, this is almost like you know you're watching real sports. And I like that's kind yeah. of you know what we're trying to get to. And then as the game started, and he's in, you know, he just got totally lost. He had no idea what the hell was going on then. But the just the the way that we're evolving in terms of the production, like this is a big step up compared to last year. And that last it was a big step up compared to the year before. I can't wait to see what will happen in season four, uh, in terms of what we're going to bring to the table there. But you know. Also with the the rise of Dota, I mean, you could definitely see a lot of elements taken from the Dota 2 setup and the Dota 2 transitions. I see a lot of similarity between the Dota 2 International and, and the World Finals here mm -hmm. from League of Legends. I see a lot of similarity. Uh, and again, like healthy competition breeds innovation. So uh, it's really great that Dota is becoming that big and that popular because now it gives us something to benchmark against as well. Yeah, it's, it's WWF and WCW in the late 90s all over again. Yeah, and I think he makes a good point. I mean, I didn't get to check much of the worlds out for LOL, but I watched TI3, uh, and it reminded me of an ESPN broadcast. And that's, yeah. you know, comparing it to real sports, I know some people like it, some people don't, but if you can look like ESPN, then that's a good thing. Like, that's yeah. a really good thing, right? And yeah. the way they transitioned from the caster desk to the games and had instant replay ready to go all of that kind of stuff, like that's really good for eSports. And if we continue to look more and more like ESPN or the NFL or TSN or whatever it is, that's only a good thing. But still, it'll draw still more keeping people those in. elements that are our own. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And this is coming from the guy who's from the fighting game community, and I'm saying those kind of things. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm most fighting game uh, tournaments cast from a cardboard box. And <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And we all drink the rainwater from the gutter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tattered yeah. shorts and winner, uh, winner gets a ride home. Gloves, yeah. So. Uh, cool. And so, when does season four uh, begin? I don't actually know the official date, but if they're gonna be, if it's gonna be a lot like last year, then they'll probably do all of their preliminary tournament stuff early January, because that's what we did this year. Uh, they what they did is they had the stuff started January, but they didn't cast it. They actually had all these right personalities just host the streams on directed camera. And they would actually be kind enough to change the scoreboards for us. But that's about all they, they would do. They would put up the scoreboards and then they would leave it. And they would let us as casters restream it in order to gain, you know, some content for ourselves. So there's like, you know, six or seven different personalities or uh, groups that would cast these qualifying uh or preliminaries to figure out who would go up against the pros and then they would kind of take over from there. So if they're going to follow that and someone in chat here is saying they probably are, then season four will probably start um, about February then. So if they do the preliminaries again in January, then the official season should probably start end of January, about February or so. But it's not just the LCS that's going to be in season four. The Coke Zero partnership? <laughs> Yeah, I find it weird they have to say Coke Zero. Like, what's wrong with Coca Cola? But no, it's not um, Coca Cola. It's Coke Zero. But it's owned by whatever. <laughs> I'm not a marketing guy at all. But the Coke Zero Challenger League, and again, like that Iron Fist just got bigger right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 
It's, it always looks good on the surface. You're like, wow, Coke Zero is on board. They must be friendly and love the community. <laughs> they wouldn't just be in it for money. <laughs> um, but we'll see what happens. Well, I mean, Coke Zero is now on board for Challenger League. We have American Express doing lol credit cards. We have Nike sponsoring teams. I mean, we're getting a lot of bigger names involved in this stuff. Yeah. Uh, I do want to get to the lightning round, Sean, but I need four minutes to type out the rest of my questions. Are you familiar with the lightning round? Not at Just all. Just lie and say yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Bring it on. <laughs> uh, I'll explain the lightning round when I get to it, but I need like three minutes to do up the questions. Uh, Mike, um, do you mind sticking around, Sean, for that three minutes of blank while Mike talks about Canada Cup? Yeah, whatever. Fantastic. Mike, uh, you were you were in Canada Cup uh, in Vancouver, what was it now, two weekends ago? Yeah, two weekends ago. Why don't you fill us all in on the fighting game pinnacle in uh, Canada? Sure, absolutely. So I would say the two biggest fighting game community events in Canada would have been uh, Toryukin 2 in Toronto in May this year, which was an Evo qualifier. Uh, I was at that as well. Uh, and then Canada Cup, which was uh, two weekends ago in Vancouver, Canada. They are hosted by Canada Cup Gaming. And uh, Canada Cup Gaming puts on a really excellent show. I actually helped uh, stream the second stream this weekend as well as the after-party stream. And it's probably the event that attracts the most pros from the U.S. and actually attracts the most pros from overseas. Uh, mainly because the big uh, kind of event-defining tournament at canada cup is what's called the international 5v5 in street fighter 4 while north america loves marvel and we all go crazy for marvel marvel tends to be more of a north american fighting game where uh the u.s and canada get hype about it where street fighter 4 is still the international kind of gold standard that everyone in the entire world plays and still loves uh so there's an international team tournament 5v5 at canada cup and that draws uh, a team, a 5v5 team from Japan, a 5v5 team from Northeast Asia, from um, all over the world. There's been some European teams there, teams from Singapore, as well as teams from Canada and the U.S. So this brings out all of the, you know, top level pros uh, from just about all over the world. So um, other than a couple big tournaments in the U.S. and Evo, it probably has one of the biggest international components. Uh, not just U.S. players, but uh, Far East players as well. So the 5v5 is a really big event. Uh, Japan and the Asian teams take it very, very seriously and to prove that, uh, you know, they're the best Street Fighter country in the world. Uh, Japan had won it two years in a row, and surprise, surprise, they won it this year as well. Um, and they get a 10K pot bonus for... The 5v5, which is nothing too uh, shabby, but that's the real draw of the event. So where a lot of North American events have become mostly Marvel events, Canada Cup is still a Street Fighter 4 tournament through and through. And uh, very awesome. Team Japan won. There was an upset in AE. Uh, one of the Chinese players, Zhao Hai, won Street Fighter 4. Uh, Filipino champ actually beat Chris G in Marvel, which was a big upset. Um, and then, of course, the... Really, the crazy thing about Canada Cup is that Lap Chi, the organizer of the event, knows how to throw a really crazy big after party. So the after party after the event was uh, really good. We streamed that as well. And there was lots of uh, money matches and drinking matches where every time you finished a match, you had to take Jaeger bombs and things like that. So a lot of the... Uh, Japanese players uh, did a lot of the money matches and drinking matches, and uh, they tried to hold their own as best as they could, but when you're eight or nine Jaeger bombs deep in 30, 40 minutes, and you're 110 pounds soaking wet, it's uh, going to catch up to you. Let's just say that. And the, the Japanese players provided some of the funniest moments of the entire weekend, that's for sure. Fantastic. That is all the time that I needed. <laughs> I finished up the last word, as you said, drunk Japanese players. So it sounds like hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was an amazing event. Uh, shout outs to Lapchi and all the Canada Cup guys for having me uh, at the event and helping out with the stream, all that kind of stuff. It was a great event. Really, really, really fun. If there's one tournament you want to go to, heck, you couldn't. You don't even have to go to the tournament. Just go to the after party. <laughs> but uh, the tournament's really awesome to watch, and it's uh, awesome to see all the, you know, the Far East. Uh, 
players get really hype and you know are side betting in the in the crowd and you know really taking pride in the 5v5 yeah there's ten thousand dollars on the line but for them it's really about the pride of being the best street fighter country in the world and they take it so so seriously it's uh really awesome to see fantastic well, uh, it is time now for the lightning round. Uh, Sean, I will inform you what that is right after I give you uh, a minute to uh, give any shout outs you want to do. Uh, we also call it last words um, because you may not make it through the lightning round. So if you want to give uh, <laughs> shout outs, where can we follow you? Um, Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, all that. When are you casting next? Things like that. Uh, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, all just four core jester. It's Google. I own Google. It's, nice. yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty good like that. Oh, you're the guy um, that started Google. Right. <laughs> yeah, I made it just so you could search my name out there. Gotcha. Um, I wish. Wow. Yeah, Google came out when I was in high school, man. That was a while back. Um, in terms of that, what am I doing next? I'm supposed to be doing some shout mania or some shoot mania. Oh, cool. Either this week or this weekend. I'm not entirely too sure what the plan is, uh, but then I'm going to be at WCS Toronto. Not as, not as a caster. I'll just be there. Fantastic. We will both be there as well. That sounds like uh, drinks. Yeah, it sounds like it. Let's fill that Timo <laughs> hat with whiskey. Oh yeah, uh, like <laughs> like I'm gonna bring a Timo hat to a Starcraft. Event. We can do Jagger bombs after Street Fighter matches. Come on, let's go. <laughs> I'll lose on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it looks like it's another one. Fantastic. Uh, here comes the intro video of the lightning round, and I've reinstalled XSplit, so we're gonna pray that XSplit doesn't crash when I play this. Oh my god, it worked. Lord, thunder in Jesus. Fantastic. So, Mr. Sean, Four Court Jester Delaney, welcome to the lightning round. I know you've watched the 33 episodes that preceded this one, so I won't bore you with the details, but for any fans of Four Court Jester that have joined us tonight for uh, him being on the show, I will inform you that the lightning round is this. It is 10 skill testing questions. They are mentally and physically demanding, and they need to be answered lightning quick. They will take you to the edge and back, possibly to the edge once more. There is no forgiveness. There is no sanity. There is only the lightning round. So I'll ask you right. once and once only, Sean, are you ready for the lightning round? Captain Timo on duty. <laughs> <laughs> a simple yes would have sufficed. <laughs> question number yep. one. There's always a hockey question uh, in the lightning round, and this one actually has two. But the first one is this. Your pick for the Stanley Cup. Maple Leafs. Incorrect. <laughs> minus one. <laughs> if you watch That's not a good start to the lightning round. I'm, I'm a Habs fan, so <laughs> minus, <laughs> minus one. <laughs> Don't use numlock. Okay, minus one. Not doing too well off the bat, but there's lots of room to improve. Question Neither number two. <laughs> question number two of the landing round. How awesome is Mundo on a scale of ten to one million? Mm, Five hundred thousand. That is correct for one point. <laughs> so you're currently at zero. Uh, Mundo is the only character I play in League of Legends. I usually rack up about three to four games a year in League, and I've been doing so for the past, <laughs> oh, probably four years, maybe five. And I strictly play Mundo. I have all of his skins. I'm quite good with Mundo, but I only ever play Mundo. <laughs> and now you rate? know the rest of the story. Zero points heading into question number three. Uh, number three, your worst mistake ever well casting. I uh, called a tidal wave a tornado once. Was it a Sharknado? No, not even. There was no. <laughs> Anyone seen involved. that movie? It's supposed to be really good. I have not seen it. It has Ian Ziering <laughs> in it, though, so that makes me want to see it. Uh, one point for that. That's not too bad. Uh, question number four: Riot has to make a new game. What is this new game called? <laughs> <laughs> they could, they could call it anything. And it'll sell. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> exactly. And you're in charge of coming up with the name. So what is it? Oh, I'm. Oh, okay. Uh, Cassidy's daughter. Yeah. <laughs> KD for short. I'll give a point a trip for that. Self discovery. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, an adult title. <laughs> Mature. I think they'll sell even more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Point for that. Uh, so you are in the positive end with two points, I believe. Don't worry. Yes. The Leafs won't win anyways. Well, yeah, obviously. Uh, <laughs> question number five. What is the worst item in the game? 
The worst item, Alm Wrecker. Never heard of it. Plus one. <laughs> That's why it's the worst item. <laughs> <laughs> Three points. Uh, question number six. This is the second part of the hockey question. I want you to build me a hockey team. Uh, so five players and a goalie built out of the League of Legends characters. Oh, okay. Um, Wukong, forward. Sona, defense. Mundo, goalkeeper. Yes. Ari, forward. And I don't know any other position in hockey. <laughs> I wasn't looking for the specific positions other than goalie, but... Uh, the team you have is pretty impressive. I would have put Mundo on defense and probably Anivia with the wall in goal, but that's just me. I was thinking he just burning agony everything around him as the puck comes flying. It okay. just burns. <laughs> Point for that. <laughs> Fantastic team, and they could, in fact, defeat the Maple Leafs. Yeah, they would. <laughs> uh, Mike, I was supposed to let you know that you have a special question for the night. So, Mike, what is your special question for Sean Delaney? Uh... Good question. I don't have a question. Um, is that the question? Yeah, probably. The question, is, <laughs> the question is, does Mike have a question? And the que the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for preparing me for the show, John. <laughs> I, I literally made that up 45 seconds ago. Uh, due, to Mike's, due to Mike's incompetence, we will award you a uh, pity point for that. Moving on to yes. question number eight. Uh, a superhero... <laughs> That they I live need, to serve. <laughs> a superhero that they need to model a League of Legends character after. I want to say Sivir, but I may, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Yeah, so they're going to make a new character in League, but it's going to be modeled after a superhero. Ah, yeah. right. Okay. Uh, there's not really that many left out there that are kind of unique. Like... Everyone already has a skin that almost looks like a superhero, including Super Teemo, who actually looks like friggin' Superman. <laughs> um, and my comic lore is really not up there. So, uh, yeah, I wanted, to say, I wanted to say Sivir because she, I think she would be a fantastic Wonder Woman, but obviously that skin already exists. Oh, ah, okay, so you flipped so. it on me. You were looking for casting for a superhero. Who would the league, what, which league character would play that superhero? Yeah. Okay, I yeah. can award you a point for that because that is creative. That is super creative. So it's six. You're six points out of a possible eight right now. Uh, doing quite well, actually. Uh, I can't even think of a superhero that doesn't even have a representation in law at this point. Green what about Dragon Ball Z characters? Have they done any Dragon Ball Z skins? That's like superheroes. Zack is basically Majin Buu. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm out. <laughs> you guys and your freaky DBZ talk. Uh, question number nine. You have six points currently going for the record. Uh, you have a choice. You have to pick one or the other. You can either play League but no other video game for the rest of your life. Or you can play other video games but you can never play League again starting from right now. Which do you choose? Well, I'll, def I'll definitely take the latter. Play yeah. other games? Yep. Other games means Peggle, so you have to choose that one. <laughs> Peggle I, 2, I thought launch you were... for Xbox One, by the way. Get in there. <laughs> I thought you were a committed uh, League of Legends fan. I'm disappointed. Remember? Iron Fist. <laughs> oh, right, 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 right. The hand you gotta go where the pastures the are green, man. Uh, yeah. So I will award you a point for that because you were on it. So seven points going into the final question, number ten. Uh, you're in a strange elevator and you find yourself surrounded by the CEOs of Riot. You have 30 seconds of their time where they're willing to listen to anything you have to tell them. What do you tell the CEOs of Riot? I cut the brakes. <laughs> you would just kill them. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> just a free fall to death. Wow. Wow. And what would you do with the other 28 and a half seconds? <laughs> Follow me, Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. Four Court Chester. <laughs> oh, wow! <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, so I'll tally that up. Eight points out of a possible ten, uh, which does qualify <laughs> you, of course, for our Tournament of Champions happening at the end of the year where we bring back our top 16 uh, lightning round combatants for a uh, Tournament of the Death where they face off in a lightning round. 
So uh, that'll be happening uh, never. So don't get excited <laughs> about that. But I do want to thank you ever so much, uh, Sean, for coming on the show tonight. Uh, we did meet before at Lane ETS, and I was excited to have you on the show when I heard your name come up again. And I'll be sure to follow uh, everything you do <laughs> from this point forward now that I actually uh, know you on a more personal level. And I can't. Well, we're also see each other at WCS. That, I was just about to say that. And we're also going to get uh, White Girl Wasted at uh, WCS. Sounds like a plan. Fantastic. Uh, Mike, anything to sign off the show? Uh, yep. Uh, if you are in the Halifax area the next month, uh, Ralston Arcade will be doing fighting games at Halcon 2013. So come out, play some fighting games like Dive Kick, Street Fighter, and Marvel. Uh, you'll be able to find out about all of the fighting game community events going on in Halifax at Halcon. We'll have brochures for if you like Blaze Blue, if you like Street Fighter, if you like Marvel, whichever games uh, you like to get involved in the community as well. And then we have our large uh, maritime major fighting game event coming up in November 23rd and 24th. It's called Low Tide Throwdown. It'll be at the Nova Scotia Community College in Dartmouth. And you'll see Street Fighter, Marvel, Third Strike, Injustice, Tekken, Blaze Blue, and Dive Kick there. And you'll see all of them. Dive Kick! (laughs) And you'll see all of uh, the Maritime's best fighting game players duke it out. Um, It is the same weekend as MLG Dota, and I've recently gotten super huge into Dota. So we will have a projector showing Dota as well, just for me and three other guys to watch it while the fighting games are going on. So uh, if you are a fighting games player and actually like to watch Dota, you won't be missing out because I want to watch MLG Dota as well, even though I'll be running the tournament, running the stream, running the brackets, selling merchandise, and doing just about everything else at the entire event. So come out and do that as well. (laughs) (laughs) Do you remember earlier on the show, Mike, when I asked if you could filibuster like Frank? Yeah, I just did it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. (laughs) <laughs> Guys, remember to grab your sh- tickets for uh, WCS Toronto <laughs> Season 3 Grand Finals happening uh, October. <laughs> well, I don't even remember now because I'm so flustered. 26th, 27th, or 25th, 26th, 27th. Uh, you can get day tickets, weekend passes, premium passes, everything. WCSToronto.eventbrite.com. Follow us on uh, Facebook.com slash Esports Canada for updates or on Twitter at Esports underscore Canada. And you can give me a follow too, but you don't have to unless you want to. Thank you again to our guest, and hopefully uh, Nick makes it back next week, but Frank will be on hiatus. Thanks.